Some fifty-odd years ago, Lake Charmaine had been the site of a rich kid's summer camp. The owner had gone belly up, and Grandpa bought the entire lake and surrounding acreage on the cheap. He'd fixed up the camp director's house and tore down most of the lakefront buildings. But farther in the woods, where no one went anymore, he left the kids' bunks alone to rot. My sister Linda and I used to explore them, sifting through their ruins for old treasures, playing hide-and-seek, daring ourselves to seek the boogeyman we were sure watched and waited. Elizabeth rarely joined us. She liked to know where everything was. Hiding scared her. When we stepped out of the car, I heard the ghosts. Lots of them here, too many, swirling and battling for my attention. My father's won out. The lake was hold your breath still. But I swore I could still hear Dad's howl of delight as he cannonballed off the dock, his knees pressed tightly against his chest, his smile just south of sane, the upcoming splash a virtual tidal wave in the eyes of his only son. Dad liked to land near my sunbathing mother's raft. She'd scold him, but she couldn't hide the laugh. I blinked and the images were gone. But I remembered how the laugh and the howl and the splash would ripple and echo in the stillness of our lake. And I wondered if ripples and echoes like those ever fully die away, if somewhere in the woods my father's joyful yelp still bounced quietly off the trees. Silly thought. But there you go. Memories, you see, hurt. The good ones most of all. You okay, Beck? Elizabeth asked me. I turned to her. I'm going to get laid, right? Perv. She started walking up the path, her head high, her back straight. I watched her for a second, remembering the first time I'd seen that walk. I was seven years old, taking my bike, the one with the banana seat and Batman decal, for a plunge down Goodhart Road. Goodhart Road was steep and windy, the perfect thoroughfare for the discriminating stingray driver. I rode downhill with no hands, feeling pretty much as cool and hip as a seven-year-old possibly could. The wind whipped back my hair and made my eyes water. I spotted the moving van in front of the Ruskin's old house, turned, and... First pow. There she was, my Elizabeth walking with that titanium spine, so poised even then, even as a seven-year-old girl with Mary Jane's and a friendship bracelet and too many freckles. We met two weeks later in Miss Sobel's second-grade class, and from that moment on, please don't gag when I say this, we were soulmates. Adults found our relationship both cute and unhealthy, our inseparable tomboy kickball friendship morphing into puppy love and adolescent preoccupation and hormonal high school dating. Everyone kept waiting for us to outgrow each other, even us. We were both bright kids, especially Elizabeth, top students, rational even in the face of irrational love. We understood the odds. But here we were, 25-year-olds, married seven months now, back at the spot when at the age of 12, we shared our first real kiss. Nauseating, I know. We pushed past branches and through humidity thick enough to bind. The gummy smell of pine clawed the air. We trudged through high grass. Mosquitoes and the like buzzed upward in our wake. Trees cast long shadows that you can interpret any way you wanted, like trying to figure out what a cloud looked like or one of Rorschach's ink blots. We ducked off the path and fought our way through thicker brush. Elizabeth led the way. I followed two paces back, an almost symbolic gesture when I think about it now. I always believed that nothing could drive us apart. Certainly our history had proven that, hadn't it? But now more than ever, I could feel the guilt pushing her away. My guilt. Up ahead, Elizabeth made a right at the big semi-phallic rock, and there on the right was our tree. Our initials were, yup, carved into the bark. E.P. and D.B. And yes, a heart surrounded it.